Welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us uh, here at Magazine Italian Art for today's lecture. I am Roberta Minucci, uh, the current scholar in residence at uh, Magazzino um, and the curator of the lecture series entitled Arte Povera, Artistic Tradition and Transatlantic Dialogue. Bringing the research program to life um, has been a great joy and a very rewarding experience and I would like to thank all my colleagues here at Magazzino for their help and support in the process. This year's lecture series interrogates Arte Povera's artistic identity, exploring how during the 1960s and 1970s artists associated with Arte Povera reconsidered and redefined their artistic practices by taking into account on the one hand the legacy of artistic tradition and on the other hand the dialogue with American art. The Italian artist's relationship with the United States was crucial within the artistic context of the time. References to Italian and European cultural heritage in Arte Povera appear to be employed to reclaim a specific artistic identity in the face of the increasing global relevance of American contemporary art. While Italy became a testing ground for experimental practices attracting international artists, the Italian ones traveled to and exhibited in the United States where they found an important platform for presenting the work to a, different, to a new audience. This led to an unprecedented artistic exchange between the two sides of the Atlantic, leading Italian and American artists to engage in a sustained dialogue that is still awaiting to be examined in the scholarly domain. By considering the Italian artists' relationship with their own cultural heritage, as well as with the international artistic scene, the lectures explored the complex dynamics embedded in the progressive definition of an artistic identity for Arte Povera. I hope that you will join us for the last lecture that will be uh, on Sunday, uh, April the 30th, uh, and that will uh, be delivered by Dr. Raffaele Bedarida, who will examine the promotional reception of Arte Povera in the United States in relation to the 19, uh, 1968 exhibition Young Italians. Today I have the pleasure to present Dr. Laura Petican, who will explore Arte Povera's relationship with the Baroque as a historical and conceptual category. Her scholarly investigation by positioning Arte Povera in a perspective of continuity with the past rather than rupture, while examining its connection with artistic tradition, has provided an important source of inspiration for my own research. So I'm particularly glad that she's joining us here um, to share her research. Dr. Laura Petican is an art historian, curator, author and cultural programs director. Her research is centered in contemporary Italian art and fashion studies. Dr. Pettigan received her BA and MA in art history from Western University Canada, a PhD from Jacobs University in Germany and a postdoctoral fellowship awarded by the Social Sciences and Research Council of Canada. She has authored the monograph Arte Povera and the Baroque Building an International Identity, followed by Contemporary Italian Art, Fashion, and the Evolution of Italianita, to be published in 2024 with the Routledge Research in Art, Art History series. She's editor of Fashion and Contemporaneity, Realms of the Visible, co editor of the recently published In Fashion, Culture, Commerce, Craft, and Identity and was exhibition reviews editor for Catwalk, the journal of fashion, style, and beauty. Her research has been presented with the College Art Association, American Association of Italian Studies, the Italian Art Society, the Fashion Exploring Critical Issues Conference in Oxford in the United Kingdom, the Center for Italian Modern Art in New York, and the American University of Rome in Italy. Dr. Pettigan has served as chair of the Arts and Culture Commission of Corpus Christi, as a collections committee member of the Art Museum of South Texas, 
and is curatorial advisor for Blue Light Contemporary. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Laura Pedigan. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Roberta, for the kind introduction and for the invitation to join you here today. A word of thanks also to Carolina Choynowska and Laura Francia for uh, their assistance in facilitating my visit. Thank you. To director Vittorio Calabrese and Magazzino Italian Art co-founders, Nancy Olnick and Giorgio Spanu, thank you for the opportunity to contribute to your lecture series. I am honored to present my work here among such esteemed company. And finally, thank you audience for attending my presentation here today. So my lecture will provide um, an overview of the research I have undertaken on the 1960s and 70s Italian art movement, uh, Arte Povera, in the context of its socio-political and cultural environment. When I embarked upon, yes, Oh, here. Is this any better? A little better? Better yet? Louder. <laughs> thank you. Is that better? Yes? Okay, thank you. So when I embarked upon this line of research some time ago, it presented somewhat of an alternative perspective to much scholarship up until then on the group, which positioned it as a rupture with the past. What I have looked at instead has considered that this revolutionary group was intimately tied to its historical cultural context and specifically exhibited distinct ties to the Baroque. So what I'm showing you on these text-based slides is essentially the organizational structure of that earlier research that I did. Some of that earlier research discussed the historical context of cultural heritage in post-war Italy, the effects of fascism on Italian cultural production, and the social effects of the Italian miracle. It considered Germano Cellant's part in the launch of the group and proposed a critical foundation for mapping the Baroque and Arte Povera scholarship. So today I'll spend some time outlining the notion of Baroque centricity as a way to describe the, the presence of the past in Arte Povera, followed by an application of that model to a selection of works. These implications are discussed in the context of Chelan's internationalist project. So to give a brief historical context, the rupture with the past that many associate with Arte Povera is identified in what was a new ideology in terms of formal structure, an approach to materials, and the evolving relationship between art and the once passive spectator who was becoming an active participant. This shift in conception of the aesthetic act was a response to the socio-political environment where recent history had seen Italy's legacy of Roman antiquity and the Italian uh, Renaissance and Baroque eras deployed in the construction of Mussolini's fascist state. The Italian miracle, the period of economic growth between 1958 and 63, had significant effect on cultural identity, but that post-war economic recovery was not without consequence. Changes reflected in aesthetic expression registered the country's efforts to adapt to a changing social landscape. Unemployment and the inadequacy of Italy's education system highlighted the country's difficulty in adapting to rapid modernization. Entering the international sphere of culture and economics, these issues had a profound effect on the socio-political situation of the 60s and 70s, where prosperity was impeded by new social tensions. Artistic production turned to a total engagement with contemporary existence when traditional modes of expression appeared insufficient. So in this context then, in the late 1960s, individuals such as Germano Cellant, a young curator from Genoa, aspired to represent Italian artists and culture to the international art scene. 
Chalant's promotion of the group as both revolutionary and as participants in an historical cultural trajectory has guaranteed a place among major cultural developments of the 20th century, and this presents a contradiction. With Chilant's text, Arte Povera scholarship is based on the notion of rupture and renewal with respect to the cultural past. The works do present a conceptual departure from modes of expression, from traditional modes of expression, excuse me, but this was not a rupture so much as a reinterpretation of a deeply seated mode of expression. While radically minimalist in comparison to the classical monuments that mark the Italian landscape, the contradiction then is that Arte Povera, in its pared down, seemingly poor appearance, is not only inextricable from its historical cultural milieu, it is decidedly Baroque. So in that earlier research I did, I used the term Baroque-centric to denote the persistence of commonly accepted Baroque characteristics identifiable in Arte Povera works. Gathered from seminal works in Baroque historiography, including those of Heinrich Wolflin, William Fleming, John Rupert Martin, Marshall Brown, and Giuliano Briganti, certain traits widely associated with Baroque art and architecture are found reinterpreted in this 20th century movement. Baroque-centric conveys an expression of general concepts and themes related to the historical Baroque, a conceptual rather than visual or historical representation of Baroque traits. It does not suggest that Arte Povera works are Baroque, but that their conception is centered on an atmospheric geographical influence composed of Baroque monuments, cityscapes, and in more general terms, a sensibility. Baroque-centric links the contemporary works to their cultural past while allowing for the articulation of a distinct contemporary expression. Baroque-centric is separate from the European characterization of the Baroque and Neo-Baroque articulated primarily in reference to literature and concerned with notions of movement, instability, and metamorphosis, and from the Latin American neo-Baroque rooted in the visual arts where overt, overt sensuality, extravagance, and spectacle are given as defining characteristics. Referring to Arte Povera works as Baroque-centric identifies a common interest in coextensive space, time, an innovative and sensual use of materials, a connection with the natural world, and an interest in essential energies and tensions. The rupture perceived between Arte Povera works and the more traditional works of their predecessors is rather a reinterpretation in which the past gains new meaning and relevance. The necessity for this new term grew from the wide range of meaning associated with the Baroque. From its derogatory meaning in the mid 18th century, judged against the principles of classicism, the Baroque was a zeitgeist of aesthetic compromise. Following Wolflin's works of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, a concept of the Baroque as a distinct movement in its own right influenced scholarship into the mid 20th century. Where Baroque works were thought to build upon classical principles toward a new sensitivity and connection to the natural world. The Baroque became a point of interest for artists, historians, and critics who saw its relevance in an alternative mode of expression to the dominant rigid stance of modernism. Henri Faucillon's Life of Forms and Art of 1934 saw the Baroque as a recurrent style in several eras, symbolizing the most free moment of forms, having abandoned limits where the artistic act is a living entity that it exists and lives in the same space and, as the viewer and moves with the processes of nature from time to time and place to place. Umberto Eco's open work of 1962 applies that notion of openness to Baroque forms where subjectivity becomes an important part of the work and where representation is replaced by living experience. The debate surrounding the meaning of Baroque was also addressed in a 1946 issue of the Journal of Aesthetics and Art Criticism, 
where authors proposed meanings for the Baroque in Baroque art and culture across different disciplines. Wolfgang Steckow was one who proposed three with respect to art history. Aside from its derogatory meaning, the second is a chronological designation, a zeitgeist. The third, a recurrent style that follows a classical period. In what Steckow calls a mess, in defining a meaning for the term, Thomas Monroe's 1946 essay called Style in the Visual Arts, a Method of Stylistic Analysis, suggests a model used as the basis for constructing Baroque centricity. Style is composed of traits combined to form compound descriptive types. He defines style as, quote, a compound descriptive type which requires a comparatively large number of specifications for clear definition. It consists of a combination of traits or characteristics which tend to recur together in different works of art or have done so in the art of some particular place and period, end of quote. So Monroe's compound descriptive type is employed where abstract recurrent traits, a constituent trait complex is identified. The changing history of a style name is noted where the term Baroque transitions from an historic division, the 17th century, for example, to a concept of style. And this style concept, or the series of traits, becomes a recurrent type applied to an analysis of the Baroque in Arte Povera. So Monroe's Baroque thereby becomes Baroque centricity to emphasize that its application to Arte Povera works does not suggest a literal appropriation or imitation of the Baroque, but an expression which is centered on those abstract Baroque traits. Monroe's concept of general essentials qualifies the use of terminology even further, defined as traits regarded as most characteristic, basic, necessary, and distinctive for a style in general. <clears throat> Excuse me, in this constituent trait complex, the general essentials define characteristics central to an abstract conception of the Baroque as it relates to Baroque centricity. Monroe's model applied to defining a Baroque-centric arte povera appears here where the general essentials of the constituent trait complex are identified as nature, space, tension and theatricality, time, materials, and the senses. The traits represent a consolidation of characteristics generally agreed upon as central to the Baroque, as highlighted in an historiographical survey of Baroque scholarship. Not all works appeal to the same criteria all the time, but it may be observed that upon consideration of the physical and national context from which these artists emerge, a certain sensitivity and perpetuation of an identifiable aesthetic among their works is revealed. So, for example, Giovanni Anselmo's Structure That Eats of 1968 is a Baroque-centric conception of nature, sharing temporal and spatial realms with the spectator. The work is composed of two blocks of granite, copper wire, and a head of lettuce, combined to exploit the tension and gravity animated by the forces of nature. A natural process guides the work through a transformation to implicate the viewer in the real-time real drama of life. While the larger granite block is in an upright stationary position, the smaller block of granite is loosely fastened by the copper wire. The head, <clears throat> excuse me, the head of lettuce is wedged between the blocks, its bulk providing the necessary tension to maintain the height of the smaller granite block against the larger, resisting the pull of gravity. As the lettuce decomposes over time, it loses the ability to support the weight of the block, which gradually slides down. In this display of natural forces at work, the spectator witnesses the assimilation of art and life. Natural processes guide the collusion of materials whose inherent energy propagates the work. With the cycles of life engaged in a, a play of creative creation and decay, the work escapes the prison of objecthood and instead consumes as long as it is fed. Its necessity for food allegorizes the process of eating while the spectator's participation 
is rendered an integral element in its function. The life of the decomposing, shrinking lettuce and its effect on the structure and function of the work unfolds in real space and time, articulating the vital connections between life forms. The work would cease to function if not for human intervention and the replenishment of the food supply. With this participation, the spectator enables the process of nature while the dynamism of materials implicates nature as an integral resource for the living sculpture. The study of nature in this work parallels that Baroque interest in the natural world and natural processes, where the spectator is witness to a dynamic count encounter that spans time and lives in the same energetic field. Anselmo's materials present, the flesh, present in the flesh the cycles of life that are the subject matter of Baroque work, such as Caravaggio's basket of fruit. This fresh observation of nature takes as its subject an image from everyday life and contemplates the effect of time on natural bodies in an unidealized vision. The fruit in Caravaggio's basket, overripe and on the verge of spoil, takes its imperfections as proof of existence in the real world and reflects on the finite nature of existence. Naturalism in this Baroque still life dominates despite an otherwise composed idealistic image of abundance. It offers a memento of fleeting existence. The imperfections are what save it from the frozen image of classical works, placing it in the realm of the living. Caravaggio's realism, expressed in commonplace subject matter and an account of nature's vulnerability, provides a link to Anselmo's study. Time unfolds in Caravaggio's work and leaves its mark in nature's forms. And this remark on the flow of life is expounded in Anselmo's work where nature is the subject, the material, and the protagonist of an eating and breathing sculpture that lives, dies, and regenerates in an aesthetic act. Anselmo has exacerbated Caravaggio's acute observation of nature in a literal reenactment of the vital process itself. To illustrate how this model works regarding space, we can look at Pistoletto's mirror paintings, a body of works begun in 1961, which articulates a Baroque-centric vision in their use of space and time and immersion in a contemporary nature. These emerge from the tradition of painting in their two-dimensional surface. However, the choice of unconventional materials extends the work into the space and time of the spectator, eclipsing the three dimensions of sculpture and eradicating the boundaries between life and art. Composed of photographic images of people or domestic fittings, furniture, transposed onto tissue paper and applied onto a polished surface, they function in the combination of fixed and transient images. Within the reflective field, figures are statically positioned within the framework of a canvas, so to speak, and juxtaposed with the fleeting images of spectators as they pass into and out of the field. Collusion of distinct spatial zones means that the spectator inhabits not only the space in front of the work, but the reflected spaces on the two-dimensional surface and within the depth of the three-dimensional reflection. Luigi Carluccio has described this effect in having eyes on the backs of our heads. Photographic and reflected images merge disparate temporal realms. Spatial integration is complemented by a simultaneous engagement with the temporal. <sighs> Fixed images are brought into the present in combination with reflected images. Reciprocally, the fixed images are an historical document. The simultaneity of yesterday, today, and tomorrow ensures that the mirror paintings are constantly updated through the images they reflect. The conflation of spatial and temporal realms is a Baroque-centric conception of space, where art and spectator are assimilated in the work's unfolding process, exploiting the expressive capacity of materials. <clears throat> Peter de Hooch's painting, The Courtyard of a House in Delft from 1658, demonstrates the Baroque conception of coextensive space. As Irving Zupnik explains, the Baroque interest in depicting depth sought a level of intimacy in terms of connecting with the spectator, which he writes represents a typical Baroque composition, where, quote, 
dramatic action occurs in the immediate foreground. De Hooch's figures extend the two-dimensional space of the canvas via movement as one group enters the shallow foreground onto a terrace that implies extension into the real space of the viewer. A figure in the background faces the opposite direction to extend the space into the distance by outward gesture and a view onto the street beyond. The figures are the Baroque predecessors to Pistoletto's Baroque-centric, static and reflected figures who enter from the viewer space and extend into the distance. Both works transform their respective narratives into a network of infinite spatial realms where the manipulation of recessional depth enacts a process of exchange between depicted space and the real space of the spectator. <clears throat> the tension and theatricality of Baroque art and architecture is also seen in Anselmo's torsion works of around 1968, which exploit contained energy in a volatile combination of materials. Processes of nature and essential energies are combined to create a Baroque-centric presentation of the brute force of gravity. It uses living force as its subject matter to capture the tense energy of a situation in the idea of its potential manifestation. A wood beam is twisted in a cloth rooted in cement. The tension of the cloth is counterposed by the structure of the pole as it presses against the wall. The tension that animates this work transports the art object from its traditional boundaries to take place in the real world by way of its potential undoing and activation of the viewer's space. It happens over time, the combined forces of the twisted cloth and the weight of the wood, as long as they are configured in this way, have no end and no beginning. Its energy lives infinitely. Chaland has stated that Anselmo's things, in fact, come alive at the very moment of being composed and assembled. Bernini's David of 1623 to 24 is a Baroque referent for such works. Expressive gesture, facial expression, and coextensive space contribute to a theatrical event that unfolds in the spectator's space and time. Bernini has depicted David at the most climactic moment of the narrative as the deadly blow was about to be delivered to Goliath. David's body is twisted out of the columnar form of earlier versions of the subject his limbs reach out into the viewer's space, and tense gesture informs the spectator that a great force is about to unfold in their space, the same space occupied by an unseen Goliath. The suggestion of future action transcends the temporal confines of traditional art forms and engages in Baroque tension and dynamism. Bernini's David illustrates that tension lives in conception and not through form alone in the traversing of space from the depicted realm to the real space of the viewer. Anselmo's interpretation of Baroque tension engages the viewer in a literal connection with the work in the same transcended spatial and temporal realms. He states, quote, my work connects the energy of the world. We too consist of energy, end of quote. Kunelis has summarized this aspect of Arte Poveda's investigations into Baroque-centric tension and theatricality, placing their work in the context of a socio-geographic dialogue. He states, quote, Western culture, which of course has had its ups and downs, has accustomed us to great tensions. Great tensions have got to stay. And that's an artist statement from 1984. <clears throat> Fabro's Penelope, um, dated between uh, 1972 and 2001, also functions on a tension, however, of a conceptual nature that takes time as its subject. The work, barely visible, is composed of a single green thread that is led from floor to ceiling, ceiling to floor, repeating a slight vertical line across the span of a wall. As the thread loops through needles placed at regular intervals along the ceiling and floor, the process indicates no beginning and no end, but continues until the entire field is lightly covered with strands of green. While barely perceptible, the effect of the work is one of quiet imposition. Its scale dwarfs human proportions as the thread leads the eye both vertically towards the ceiling and horizontally across the wall, 
touching the limits of the space in a pattern whose only direction is towards infinity. It refers to the Odyssey, the Greek epic poem dated to 800 BCE attributed to Homer. Fabro conjures the character of Penelope, who endured 20 years of harassment by suitors while her husband Odysseus wandered the earth following the fall of Troy. During his absence, Penelope developed ways of avoiding contact with her suitors, one of which was to feign sleeping during their visits until her charade was discovered when her eyes were caught half open. A woman of resources, she created another de de excuse me, device for sidetracking these advances and deflecting proposals of marriage, the infinite project of the Shroud of Laertes. As Penelope worked on weaving the shroud, she pacified her suitors with the promise that upon its completion, she would make a decision on which of them she would marry. Unbeknownst to them, over three years, she wove the shroud during the day and undid her work at night, only to start all over again the next day. The weaving consumed her time, it consumed her thoughts, its progress took on an infinite existence and kept her suitors at bay until again her charade was discovered. Upon Odysseus' return to Ithaca, not only was he forced to fatally remove these suitors who had been making the most of his absence, he was forced to endure a period of readjustment. Only in proving his identity to Penelope over an extended period of time was she able to accept the stranger as the true Odysseus. From these themes of patience, restraint, and endurance, Fabro's work adopts epic, however delicate proportions whose essence derives from Penelope's self-possession and invention, in a myth whose protagonists are all put to the test of time. The obsessive repetitiveness, repetitiveness of Fabro's work is a 20th century interpretation of Penelope's infinite weaving. As it was, her invention of the never-ending shroud manipulated the otherwise natural flow of time in the Greek city of Ithaca. Penelope worked equally as diligently on the reversal of time. The undoing of her work cheated her suitors and effectively cheated time itself. Her ruse was not unlike that of Daphne in Bernini's sculptural group of 1622 to 25. Despite similarities in subject matter, where Daphne is also the focus of unwanted attention, both Fabro's Penelope and Bernini's Apollo and Daphne incorporate the notion of time manipulated as their subject matter. Bernini has depicted the climactic moment when Daphne, having been struck with Eros, lead arrow, repels Apollo's advances. Upon Apollo's pursuit, Daphne, repelled by the idea of love and searching for escape, wishes for her father, the river god Pineus, to transform her into a tree. As Apollo reaches out to grasp the young nymph, her feet are transformed into tree roots, her arms into branches, and her body enveloped by a case of bark. Thereafter, Apollo vows to love her, if not as his wife, then as the form she has taken, a laurel tree, and to incorporate her body into his bow and quiver and into the wreaths of the Roman conquerors. Daphne's escape as human from Apollo's imminent grasp represents an instant or a succession of instants as suggested by Martin, giving the illusion of temporality and the passing moment, the same eternal passing moments marked by Penelope's weaving. While Bernini's figures reach the moment of transformation in a tormented pursuit, Fabro's thread tells the story of an interminable quest highlighting the inescapable yet pliant force of time that figures as the primary subject matter in the Odyssey, Penelope, and Apollo and Daphne. Fabro's delicate green thread ties us to a collective memory of the passage of time and the infinite cycles of life. The tactile qualities of these works represents the fifth trait in the Baroque-centric trait complex. The sensual interpretation of materials in Fabro's Pieti series of 1968 to 71 is an aspect of the Baroque that resonates in Arte Povera works in a combination of natural and industrial materials. It has been argued that even during the rise of the dematerialization of the art object, Fabro was willing to churn the avant-garde waters with his outright indulgence in Baroque pleasures. 
In his piety, Fabro's choice of materials was evocative of the rich aristocratic tradition of Baroque art and architecture in his use of silk, metal, marble, and Murano glass. Composed of huge claw-shaped feet which rest directly on the gallery floor, their legs of silk reach to the gallery ceiling. Fabro has used traditional materials and techniques toward an artistic production untainted by compartmentalizing ideologies. His materials are familiar, his forms are entirely unexpected. Critics have described the silk legs as made of living tissue, evoking the sensual living quality of Baroque sculpture. The sensual immediacy of the Piedi is further emphasized by their direct presentation in the exhibition space, placed directly on the floor, whether in a gallery or in the street. This presentation transforms the Piedi into architectural elements resembling columns, integrating the work physically with the space it occupies. The monumental scale dominates the exhibition space and demands the viewer's attention. Also luxurious and highly polished, the Piedi conjure the decadence and sensuality of Baroque sculpture, such as Bernini's Ecstasy of St. Teresa from 1645 to 52, in which the artist's virtuosity has defied the limits of the medium. This work, like the Piedi, is an exercise in exploring the sensual qualities of materials. Eliminating any clear, straight, or defining line, Bernini has created so much movement that the quality of tangibility more or less vanishes. And marble itself becomes immaterial and liquid. Rowell has commented on a similar plastic sensibility in Fabro's work, which she claims is a fundamental idea in relation to Fabro's definition of the Baroque, which she explains as, quote, that of a, of a rational structure on which has been overlaid a complicated surface decoration, end of quote. Fabro elaborates on this concept as a matter of physicality, a sensuality, which is there to hide the rationalism, which is the true sense of the Baroque. While Bernini's expertise has rendered marble immaterial, the subject of the miracle itself, by way of the sensual nature of the saint's disposition, has been transformed into a real tangible event. The material and the event are inextricable from each other. Richard Dunn has discussed Bernini's blatant appeal to the senses as evidence of his belief that the church was a stage for the physical display of divine mysteries. He describes the scene as such, quote, leaning upon clouds suspended in midair above the altar, Teresa swoons, her face ecstatic with blissful pain, a smiling seraph poised above her with the arrow while bronze shafts of light cascade upon the scene. Rarely has a miracle been made so tangible, end of quote. Martin has pointed out that in this image of bodily and spiritual transport, Bernini has achieved a fusion of opposites, pleasure and pain, the temporal and the infinite, the pictorial and the sculptural. It is this notion of contradiction that Fabro calls upon. The sensuality of Baroque technical, technical devices is used to engage the viewer in a fusion of disparate elements toward a new experience of tactile sensuality traditional materials and seemingly unrelated free associations of form breathe new life into a traditional aesthetic. So part of the impetus behind this investigation that I did grew from answering the question of what significance these connections may have, that Arte Povera works are Baroque-centric. It is presumed that one generation of artists grows from the achievements of the previous, or that similar stylistic tendencies are detectable among artists living in the same national or geographic context. The answer I found is rooted in the particular time and place of Arte Povera in post-war Italy. The impulse toward rupture with the past and the articulation of a new artistic language were aspects of a socio-political response to the devastation brought about by the fascist government of the first half of the 20th century. The strides made by Arte Povera's informale predecessors marked the path for the experimentation that followed in the 60s and 70s. But a new visual language was required 
to address a changing culture and population that had suffered irreparable moral and physical damage over the course of World War II. To suggest that the radical experimentation of Arte Povera was Baroque-centric, that their work displayed distinct connections to their country's cultural heritage and was therefore tied to the past, problematizes the majority of scholarship on the movement, that their work perpetuated characteristics of their national cultural patrimony presented as somewhat explored and perhaps controversial aspect of their history. With Chelant as the official spokesperson of the movement, it is interesting to note the manner in which the new visual language from Italy was articulated to the international art community. Themes of rupture and renewal are central in the majority of Arte Povera scholarship. The guerrilla warfare was on, so to speak, in terms of distancing one's aesthetic vision from the outmoded forms of the past. However, the past is what surfaces in scholarship as well as in the works themselves. In Chelan's efforts to establish Italian art on an international stage, it was not inconvenient to emerge from a legendary cultural context. Links to the past took the form of literal and thematic references to the Baroque, an interest in time, space, tension, theatricality, and a particular sensitivity to materials. By aligning Arte Povera with the great successes of Italian cultural and a national celebrated past, Chalant took on the role of what Anthony Smith calls the political archaeologist, who conjures collective memories with the goal of reconstructing the present in the image of a past golden age. As Claudio Spadoni states, quote, the recent past often seems more dated than the distant past, which has been recycled according to need and using the requisite credentials, end of quote. This is a controversial suggestion and challenges the majority of scholarship. The challenge exists in suggesting an image of a post-war group of otherwise revolutionary artists conceptualized and presented as the heralds of a renewed Italian cultural identity in an era when extreme nationalism and the heroic past had been deployed in the utter destruction of a country. Francesco Bonami made a similar observation with respect to contemporary Italian artists in the 2008 catalog for the exhibition at Venice's Palazzo Grassi titled Italics, excuse me, Italian Art Between Tradition and Revolution, 1968 to 2008, where he referred to the current generation as operating in an ancient contemporary civilization. The exhibition illustrated the tendency in documenting Italian art to emphasize the impact of national artistic heritage on contemporary expression. It insists that the great Renaissance tradition is the backbone of contemporary art in Italy. This is not to suggest that Arte Povera artists consciously made use of their cultural heritage as capital in an effort to engage with a wider audience, but rather that their packaging and promotion by Chilean, for example, perhaps aligned them with a the national context that was not part of their artistic agenda, but which has nevertheless defined their output and identity as artists. So my hopes for this research were centered in the idea that it might present an alternative perspective to the post-war, to the story of post-war Italian art that might exist alongside what had previously been explored, building upon conventional characterizations of Arte Povera, which had positioned the group in a dialogue of materials-based experimentation. My research has aimed to provide an alternative to those claims of rupture and rejection of Arte Povera's past, with the impression that a consideration of the role of the past would provide a more complete picture of Arte Povera's contribution to the national and international post-war artistic arena, and a more comprehensive view of the group's identity in their geographical and cultural context. By way of a reinterpretation of basic artistic conceptions of the Baroque and responding to their contemporary sociocultural environment, Arte Povera broke with the confining classicism and perhaps even political activism of recent years. They worked from an open conception of their cultural past and its meaning in the present to articulate a Baroque-centric oeuvre 
that established their place along a national and international trajectory of artistic achievement. Francesco Menacorda summarized this idea in the catalog for the italics exhibition. He stated that, quote, the tradition revolution dichotomy within Italian art does not embody two distinct relations to the historical past, but rather two faces of the same attitude to the burden of history, seen either negatively or positively as an object of both terror and respect, end of quote. So I would hope to add to that reverence and a vision for greater understanding among our own evolving global citizenry. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Clara, for this very fascinating talk. Um, I wanted to, uh, so um, if um, the public has any question now, it's, the, it's time to uh, open the floor. So um, I, I, would, I will start with the first question. Um, um, it's very interesting that you were the first, to, the first um, scholar to investigate Artipalvera's relationship with the past, um, so specifically and in particular with the Baroque. I believe your book was published in 2011, if I'm not wrong. And we know um, that is a path of research that has been uh, explored uh, more consistently recently uh, thanks to two contributions in particular. I'm thinking of uh, Laura Moore Cecchini and her book Baroque Mania that investigates uh, the importance of Baroque for Italian vision culture, but in a different period, in an early period, the, um, between the end of the 19th century and the first part of the 20th century. And I'm also thinking of uh, Teresa Kittler's um, um, article on um, the relationship between Challen's writing and his mentor's writing. Uh, we know his mentor was uh, Eugenio Battisti, was um, um, a scholar of uh, Renaissance and the Baroque. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking, um, as we know, there is, uh, there is much more interest in the last years, and, and you were the first one to, let's say, start this new path of research. Do you think there is uh, still space for further exploration? Uh, are there other directions that this uh, research can take? So I was wondering how, if you see any future possibilities from this research to expand in a way. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, well, first of all, um, that's a generous comment to say I, I was the first. <laughs> um, I cannot take a credit for that because I was um, dialed into this line of research and this topic and these relationships in Arte Povera by my mentor, Professor John Hatch, who is a professor of modern and contemporary art at Western University in Canada. So I studied with him for a long time. And the idea um, for, for this research that I have done in my subsequent studies and later publications really stemmed from a graduate seminar class I took with Professor Hatch. And um, he asked me the provocative question one time, what do you think about the Baroque and, and this, this movement? And I, I had no idea. And so that was the very beginning of, of a lot of work for me <laughs> to figure that out. Um, and so it stemmed from his graduate seminar class, that very idea. Um, so um, as for subsequent um, studies that have been undertaken by other um, very engaged scholars, um, once I finished with my dissertation and published that, the book, um, I certainly felt um, somewhat exhausted with the idea of that, but very pleased and surprised to see that others saw potential in it. And what I can discern from that later development is that the Baroque is seen as a generative, um, eternally productive point of inquiry, 
because metaphorically, if we, if we continue to understand it metaphorically as openness, as described by Umberto Eco, um, it will continue to be open and generative and full of possibility for all different kinds of explorations that will help towards explaining, um, not necessarily the avant-garde, but um, artistic expression, aesthetic experimentation, which is um, other than um, tradition. So I think it will continue to be a generative metaphor in that sense. And it looks like it has been so far, which is great. So I didn't kill it. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask a second question. Um, I was um, particularly struck by your description of Anselmo's um, sculpture, um, Struttura che mangia, uh, structure that eats. Um, your very compelling description. And um, I, um, as you were describing it, um, I thought of two main concepts which were also embedded in a sculpture in a way in, in the contemporary sculpture, not necessarily in the Baroque, I believe, I'm not sure, maybe. Um, and these are like the, the concept of maintenance of the work and also of decay. You explore the concept of decay in relation to Caravaggio's um, basket of fruit. And I was wondering whether you could expand a bit more on these two concepts concepts like maintenance and decay in relation to Anselmo's work? Well, um, I think there is probably a paradox inherent in the way that the sculpture um, will cease to function without some type of human intervention. So I guess there could be an argument made for, does that particular work truly continue to evolve over time if it does need food? Um, and you probably know there are different versions of that with um, meat, others with vegetables, or different images with um, sawdust to collect the liquids that fall out of it. So um, there is a certain um, codependence, I suppose, which is maybe um, a point of instability in the conception of that structure if it is supposed to be infinitely living because it will die, <laughs> it will die, but it will exist as something else. So I guess there are coexisting and conflicting um, concepts inherent in the living idea of that because it does depend on others. And is that also not a living, uh, you know, a concept of life and life cycles? And I don't know if that yeah. elaborates sufficiently. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you for your lecture. Um, I was <clears throat> wanting to ask you um, if you feel that there's some similarity between the, the background and of the art of the Baroque artists who we saw, such as Bernini particularly, and, and the cultural and educational background of these, these artists who we're looking at today, in Arte Povera. What, what does it really mean? I mean, you know, there's certain accessibility of the Baroque art, which was quite intentional. And I wonder if that was also a thought with the Arte Povera artists we're looking at. Um, thank you for that question. Um, I think that there was probably some significant differences because Baroque art and architecture were um, largely political commissions which had a social um, agenda. And I don't think we can say the same for the, the overall project of Arte Povera. Um, your question makes me think of a question I received during my, um, the, my defense, my doctoral defense. One of the external examiners asked me, you know, well, where do you stand on all of this personally? Doesn't this leave you cold? Because I'm left cold by all of this. Um, and I think that there is um, some conceptual and ideological work to be done if we were to compare audiences between Baroque audience, the target audiences for Baroque art, art and architecture, and perhaps a niche audience 
in the 1960s and 70s for the white cube gallery scene. So in terms of artist backgrounds, um, that would be a difficult comparison, I think. Um, and I think that they were, um, they were probably ad addressing radically different audiences. However, <laughs> the effect, um, as I hope to have demonstrated, ended up being somewhat overlapping. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you mentioned, well, that's loud. <laughs> you mentioned the Baroque in uh, Latin America, and I was wondering if you think there's room for um, investigation into the works of the late 1990s there, specifically Francis Alice Pussy pushing the ice cube through the street. Has that been explored, or is that a way you see your research developing? You know, um, that is certainly something um, that has received a lot of um, critical inquiry, um, not perhaps as much as the Western European context. And the, um, the Baroque as applied to the Latin American context has for who, different reasons taken on slightly different characteristics. I touched upon that very briefly in, in one comment. But um, in, in, those, um, in that environment, um, associations to the Baroque have been somewhat confined, I would say, to um, identifying and describing expressions of spectacle, spectacle for spectacle's sake, and overt sensuality. Um, bombastic expressions. Um, and so um, I would say that conceptually it's taken a bit of a different path. Not to say that the two could not overlap, they certainly could, but I think there are two parallel coexisting paths of Baroque related scholarship to describe contemporary artworks. There, there's a difference still from what I can observe. Yeah. So one thinks of um, Arte Povera as an Italian art. Did it flourish anywhere else in the world that, would, that one could also say, you know, there's Arte Povera in some other part of the world? Yes, there were um, coexisting uh, contemporaneous movements that took, like the Gutai uh, movement, for example, was um, um, in, the, in the Far East, was proliferating around the same time. Um, and artists like Yoko Ono um, were working in highly conceptual manners and experimental modes with respect to materials, performance, um, time and spatially oriented happenings and so on. In the United States as well, there were um, parallel movements um, that certainly conceptually overlapped with a lot of what the Arte Povera artists were doing um, with different connotations, of course, without that distinct Western European recent national history, mm -hmm. um, but certainly with the impetus and impulse to experiment and break from rupture, so to speak, with the confines of modernism and tradition. Um, not to say that they did break with them, <laughs> but, uh, but certainly there was an interest in evolving with them towards new modes of expression happening I would say globally. Thank you. I mean, American minimalism seems to relate quite a lot with Baroque. I mean, Richard Serra, the huge torque, you know, and Donald Judd and Dan Flavin. I mean, what are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Um, color field painting, abstract expressionism, um, Barnett Newman, Jackson Pollock, especially when you think of the uh, physical experience of being in front of one of those works. Um, which encompasses your entire field of vision. So there's a physicality to experiencing those works which extends beyond the objecthood of traditional easel painting. So um, I think there's absolutely important parallels between... Exactly. Exactly. So I, I would agree that there's definitely overlapping tendencies and ideologies. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Laura. That has been wonderful. I'm so happy that you joined us. And I would invite the public to join us for the last lecture on the 30th, which is a Sunday. And 
Thank you so much again. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.